everybody wants to be the end. No one's willing to be the means to the end. We all want to be the end. But to actually find our purpose, to live lives of significance, ask yourself this question instead, who am I here for? Because if we're actually thinking only about ourselves, we're going to live lives that are very self-serving. But wouldn't it be great if more of us started asking the question, who am I here for? The goal of the Best You Podcast is to allow you to feel confident about what you need to do, why you need to do it, and how to do it in order to get closer and closer to your best you. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. I am super fired up to be joined by the one and only Tim Schur today. Tim, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today, man. Ah, that's awesome. I'm excited to be here. We're going to have some fun. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, Tim is coming out with a book on May 17th called The Secret Society of Success. Stop chasing the spotlight and learn to enjoy your work and life. And one of the reasons that, you know, I originally found you through Business Made Simple, but one of the reasons why I was so drawn to you and your book and the title of it and everything is because my company and the podcast and everything is called Best You. And it's very intentionally called best you because it's the best version of yourself, however you define it, however you want to improve and grow throughout your life. And so I often say like you need to define success for yourself. And I know exactly that's exactly kind of what your book is all about. Before diving too much into the book itself and and into you, I want to ask you, what is really the thing that prompted you to want to write a book on this particular topic? Like a lot of people usually have personal life things happen where maybe like you were chasing down the wrong version of success, or maybe you saw a lot of people chasing down the wrong version of success, but what was it that made you want to write the book on this? Yeah. Man, there's this amazing story of Apollo 11. And for those who, most people are probably familiar with this story. You've got Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And what a lot of people don't know is there's actually a third astronaut on that mission. His name was Michael Collins. So you've got Michael Collins. This guy ubers Neil and Buzz to the moon, drops them off, and then he actually laps the moon something like 26 times while the other guys are doing their part on the moon. And then he picks them up and they all make their way back to Earth. And you know, to me, what would make this a pretty miserable story is if Michael Collins gets back and in the press conference, he starts kind of talking as though he's a victim in this whole thing. Like it sure would have been actually nice to actually walk on the moon. You know, it it just, nobody, even though it would have been a pretty human response, that's just not the kind of thing that you would want him to say in that moment. And what makes it a beautiful story and why it's so inspiring to me is he did not respond that way. He actually talked about how content he was to have had one of the three seats. He was happy to have been part of the team and of the mission. And that really resonated with me because I felt like there's this cultural narrative that says to be successful, you have to actually walk on the moon. You have to have a role that other people would look at and actually desire. It's the thing in the spotlight. You're you're the boss. You're running the company. You're whatever. And there's a part of that narrative that's been so hard for me to get behind because for the last 15 years of my life and career, I've just been more in a behind the scenes role. And before that, I actually was really wanting to be somebody who would step into the spotlight. I had this aspiration of being a famous musician. I wanted to be the next John Mayer. And What's been interesting is my journey, wanting to be the next John Mayer to then really settling into a role behind the scenes. I've actually found that that shift for me is when I actually found a lot more contentment and fulfillment in my life. And so whenever there's this cultural narrative that's talking as though the only way to be successful or the only way to find that meaning and fulfillment is to actually step into the spotlight, there's a part of me that just doesn't quite believe it. And so the, that part of me that doesn't believe it is really wrestling with, well, what do I do then, right? 
And so what really prompted me to write this book is I felt like I'm not the only person who's likely feeling this. And so I had this idea, this dream to write a book. And so uh, to kind of get into that next phase, okay, you want to write a book, what are you going to write about? And I just started paying attention to what was really resonating with me, what was captivating my attention. And it just was a lot of conversations about success. But the stories for me that were the most captivating and inspiring happened to be talking about success that was a little different from chasing money and fame and power. There's actually this group of people that just seem to define it very differently than most. And so that really was kind of the genesis of this whole idea. And, you know, I'm really wanting to um, be somebody who can bring some validation and, you know, bring meaning and fulfillment to roles regardless of where you find yourself on the org chart. And, and hear me say this, we need all of the roles. Right. You need, if you're, if you're going to a concert, you need the person on the stage singing the song or else the whole thing doesn't work. But you also need the ticket taker and the usher and the person running the lights and the sound, the, you know, the background band, you know, the backing band, it, all of this stuff matters to pull together this experience for people. And I just want to say, I think all of these roles matter. And there is not only one that I would actually say, you have to have the one in the center stage to be successful. I just don't believe that. And I think there's a lot of people who actually feel the exact same way. Yeah. No, I think there's a lot of people who are going to resonate with this message where I think it's such a, uh, a great topic. I think so many people are like, well, I'm not that extroverted like that person is. And so I'm not going to be able to step into the spotlight. So I'm just never going to be able to be as successful as them when it's like, no, you just need to maybe define your love, that level of success a little bit differently for yourself. But one thing that I think is kind of ironic about the book and like coming from you is you have been this behind the scenes role, right? It's like I have taken taken in so much of the content from StoryBrand and Business Made Simple. And I saw you, you know, five, a handful of months ago and I was like, oh, this guy may, might be new. <laughs> it's like you've totally. been there forever or you've been there for, you know, you were with yeah. Donald for seven plus years and I just saw you. And so you were this background role. But now it's kind of funny because it's, I feel like it's ironic that you were the background role and now you are kind of like going into the spotlight to a certain extent by going off on your own and writing a book and jumping on podcasts. And so I don't really have necessarily a specific question tailored to this, but talk about kind of the irony of that and how it's and how you're kind of defining success moving forward, I guess. Isn't that fun? And also, yeah. I'm totally with you. It does feel a bit ironic. But for me, I just believe in this idea so much that, you know, when the closer we got to the book launch, the more I realized to, to do it really well. And, and to do it really well means to go speak and, you know, share these ideas with people, to be on podcasts like this one or whatever that would look like. I just don't do anything halfway. So I knew if I was going to release a book, I wanted to give it everything that I, you know, I had. And so having such a big job at StoryBrand, I also didn't in any way want to let that suffer or because to not give my best there would not be serving anyone well. And I wasn't going to do that either. So I was really faced with an impossible decision. And do I leave a dream job with people that I love working with to go chase a new dream? And there's just something about this message that I just felt like a prompting and a, a, a purpose behind it. That's like, Tim, this is your message. You have like more people need to hear this. So, you know, I think that the, to be in the spotlight is, um, I think defined a little bit differently by a lot of people. Um, so for me, I feel like I'm a behind the scenes guy. It's like, I'm writing this book for the people, by the people. It's like, I'm just, I'm yeah, one yeah. of everybody, you know, so, but what I also have, have learned is 
This book is called The Secret Society of Success, and it's about this group of people who have defined success differently. And there are stories and examples of people in behind the scenes roles, but there's just as many stories of people who are very much in the spotlight. The Tim Cooks of the world, LeBron James, Mr. Rogers, you know, these are names that people know, but I would actually say each of these are these people that I just, you know, mentioned are in the secret society. So what defines someone that is in the secret society is actually it has less to do with your position or the amount of visibility that you have and more in how you do define success, the way that you think about yourself and others and go about doing your work. So uh, it's more a posture and a mindset than anything else. Yeah, and I think that's really important for you to point out. And that was actually getting going to be what I was getting ready to say. It's not about this book isn't saying don't go to the spotlight. This book is yeah. saying define success for yourself. And for some people, that might be a little bit more visibility and a little bit more of an actual spotlight for you. But it's the reason why you're moving in the direction that you're moving is really what the book is all about. Yeah. And so I'm I'm curious for you personally, what is what has been slash what do you think is going to be the most uncomfortable part for you about moving from this behind the scenes role to somebody who has maybe a little bit more visibility and a little bit more of a spotlight on yourself? I'm so comfortable behind the scenes. I love being a part of projects and collaborating with a team of people to determine a goal that we all want to go and strive after together. So I'm very comfortable in that seat and love the kind of nature of, of how that works. So the most different thing that will happen is rather than being the guy who organizes the event and is handling all of the details, you know, for example, I'm going to be the guy on a stage. Um, that will be, that's different. That's a new experience. But you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about stepping into this new career and adventure is I love learning and I, I want to learn new skills and I want to hone in how I communicate and get even more comfortable being the guy who's actually asking the questions by hosting my own podcast. And so it's, uh, I, I think there's a lot of learning that I'm going to have to do. And I have the luxury of having been behind the scenes and supported that and been around it for so long. Um, I'm just going to have to be kind of flipping to the other side of the microphone. I think that's going to, that's the biggest challenge, but I also am excited about it. And I feel really, um, that's it. I'm excited. I just think yeah. it's going to be so fun. So you should be, you should be. I'm excited <laughs> for you. Uh, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I so believe in this message is I've seen so many other people take on other people's definition of success or take on other people's goals and then en route to it realize that either they didn't want to they want they didn't actually want to get where they were aiming for in the first place or when they faced challenge or discomfort along the way they quit because it wasn't actually their definition of success. And I really feel like the way that you have to start off by defining yourself is asking yourself why you need to be doing particular things. So for example, I have a, a client right now who's a in my membership and she was talking to me yesterday about how she's been reading Atomic Habits and she's really struggling getting through it. And we've been talking about it for weeks about how we're trying to implement it as a habit of reading more frequently. And then she, for the first time, conveyed to me yesterday that I just don't really enjoy reading books like this. I enjoy reading books more like thrillers and murder mysteries and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, then why the hell are you reading Atomic Habits? <laughs> it's like, you really? know, I think she took on this goal of reading this book because somebody else said, that you should read this book. I think a lot of people oh, at beginning of the year, New Year's resolution say, I'm going to run a 10K because somebody else says they're going to run a 10K. And then you start doing it and you're like, I hate running. Well, then don't run. <laughs> like pick a, a mode, yeah. a modality of fitness that you enjoy. Pick a book that you actually enjoy reading 
And so what I'm getting at is I feel like asking yourself why you want to do particular things is one of the biggest questions that you need to ask yourself when determining what your definition of success is. And so I wanted to get maybe your feedback on that and further insight as to the questions that we should be asking ourselves when we're trying to define success for ourselves. Yeah. I was at this leadership conference in Atlanta in this big arena, and I heard this guy named Andy Stanley speak. And the conference was around finding our purpose. And you know, I think for a lot of people, that gives them some type of a North Star towards what is it that I should be pursuing? What does success look like in my life? And he starts this conference or starts this keynote talking about this question that often a lot of people ask, like, why am I here? Which I think is a pretty fair question. It's one that a lot of us ask, like, why am I here? What is this whole thing about? And he goes on to say, why am I here is not a good question to ask. And when he said that, I'm like, what? what? Like, tell me more, right? And he says, you know, everybody wants to be the end. No one's willing to be the means to the end. We all want to be the end. But to actually find our purpose, to live lives of significance, another way of saying, it's like to define success in your life and your career, you should ask yourself this question instead. Who am I here for? Because if we're actually thinking only about ourselves, we're going to live lives that are very self serving, right? We are going to define success by what we did, what we got, right? But wouldn't it be great if more of us started asking the question, who am I here for? And what's cool about it is it still allows you to do the thing that you do, the thing that lights you up, the thing you're passionate about, but you actually get to define success by coming alongside some other people and helping them win. So when I was working at StoryBrand in my office, I actually, after I got back from this keynote, I created a like eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And up at the top, it said, who am I here for? And on it, I just had the pictures and the names of all the people at my company that I worked with. And so you know how it can be on any given day. You've got a task list like crazy, your inbox is flooded and you want to, you know, roll into the office, beeline it to your desk and just get to work. And so I just started a new routine where it almost was my first thought that I really wanted to challenge myself with was who are we showing up for today? Like who am I here for? Because the work that I do does matter, but also if I'm doing it in service of my team, it just seemed to bring about a whole lot more meaning and fulfillment uh, on the days that you know are more challenging. It, it was a nice posture to operate from. Gotcha. So you kind of went into each day trying to be less concerned with trying to get as much done, but you're more concerned with how you're impacting the people that you were with. I think it's just framing, why am I doing all this? It's like I, the work that I do is in service of others. So, you know, there's, um, in, in, I don't know if you're a basketball fan, but in, in 2020, LeBron James and the Lakers won the NBA finals, right? So they give a trophy out to, you know, the team that wins the finals. But there's another trophy that's actually given out every year, and um, it's to the scoring leader the person who had the highest points per game average in the NBA, they give a trophy after that. And it's a big deal to be the scoring leader. Michael Jordan won at a record setting like 10 times. You know, So you see a guy like LeBron and you're thinking, okay, well, here's one of the greatest NBA players of all time. He's got all the talent in the world to win that scoring title. But what I think is interesting is in 2020, LeBron James did not win the scoring title. In fact, he wasn't even in the top five. The way that he chose to play and ultimately how he and his team won the finals was he actually was interested in something else. In 2020, LeBron James won the assist leader title. He, mm. he 
was more interested in helping his teammates win, assisting them, than he was about trying to take over games and go solo. So I think another way to say it is this whole who am I here for approach. It's, you know, it's LeBron saying, I'm going to be all about the assist. What if success was in the assist? What if I show up today and actually I'm trying to help the other people around me be at their best rather than only being concerned about my own performance, how I'm setting myself up to get that promotion, to get that next title, whatever, right? So, and I even think about, you know, some of the work that you just talked about that you do, you know, in coaching other people, you're helping other people be at their best. You're all about the assist, right? Yeah. So people that seem to approach their life and their work in that way, in my opinion, are finding success in a way that I think is just a whole lot more sustainable. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that is um, very insightful for sure. Very insightful for sure. And like you said, it's a good way and a good mindset and good approach to be thinking about every single day to be, uh, to be thinking about who you're here for. I like that question a lot. I like that question a lot. One of the things that I think we all need to do kind of as we go through life and have our different seasons of life is redefine exactly what success means for ourselves. You know, you were this behind the scenes guy for, for 15 years and now you're doing something essentially completely different. And I think that with the different seasons of our life, when we're single, not that this is the track for everybody, but you know, we go from single to maybe a relationship to married and then kids. And then, you know, you have all these different people going in your life. And so you're, you're playing different roles. And so the way that you're going to view life and view your priority priorities and view what success is for you is going to change. So what do you think the process needs to look like with regards to, you know, maybe how often you redefine success for yourself or just what the process looks like for redefining success for yourself. And that could be within your company, within your family. Well, what is the process of redefining success look like? We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first, I wanted to share a quick testimonial from a past participant of the 10 week transformation program. I started running the 10 WT in the beginning of 2020 and I've had over 150 people on counting go through it. And they've seen amazing results both inside and out. If you're inspired to join after listening to the testimonial, then go to nickcarrier.com to learn more. We'll get back to the episode in just a minute, but first, here's what they had to say. Hey, I'm Adam. I joined Nick's 10-week program to get in shape for my wedding. In addition to that, to lose a little bit of weight and to bulk up my chest a little bit. I've lost five pounds, and then I've been able to increase my bench max by 20 pounds. I think the consistency, it's helped me develop better habits and helped me get into the gym five or six days a week and really see the results of my efforts and help keep me accountable throughout the entire journey through the program. You should join Nick's 10-week program. Yeah, it starts with a lot of self-awareness and reflection. And I guess the first question I'd ask someone is, are you unhappy? (laughs) Is what you're doing working for you? Yeah. Because if it is, maybe that alignment between how you're living and how you want to live is actually a whole lot closer. But some people are just in a very discontent. They're feeling something that they just don't like. They're showing up at work and they're dreading it. So it almost is to first start at, if you are unhappy, if you are not finding fulfillment and meaning in your life and your career, maybe start to ask yourself some of these questions. Is maybe one of the reasons why I'm feeling this way is because you know, this definition of success that I may be buying into is not actually the thing that I should be giving as much airtime in my life, right? Like, actually, um, there's a, a friend of mine, and she's a nurse. And she originally got into nursing because she was just so passionate about it. And here you find her in this career where she just seemed to keep getting win after win, You know, she was making good money because of her seniority. She had kind of preference when it came to the hours that she worked, the vacation that she had. But what's interesting is over time, she's actually found herself to be quite unhappy in her role. Mm. 
And if you would have four years ago said, this is where you're going to be four years from now, she would have probably been like, oh my gosh, I can't wait. But now she's living this life where she's actually quite unhappy. And so in a moment like that, it's, okay, maybe success wasn't the money. Maybe success wasn't the seniority and the preference and you know all these things. So for her, the challenge is, how do I actually tap back in to what made me come alive in the first place? And so that's gonna look different for every single person. But you know, for a lot of people, maybe they're kind of just caught in that, you know, maybe they've been living in a why am I here mode for a little bit too long. And yeah. you know, maybe a first step is starting to think, okay, why am I here? Or sorry, who maybe they need to start asking, who am I here for? And let that start to get into their head a little bit more often. Um, but you know, it really is a process. And I feel like this is one of those things that I I wish I could say, here's the path for everyone, but it really is custom based on where everybody's at. But I think the the beginning of that is probably gonna come from some type of discomfort. Yeah, no, I think that's very insightful. And I appreciate you sharing that story. And if you have further insight on that story, and if if you are willing to share it with that girl that you're talking about, did she move up like nursing ranks and have more responsibility and have more to take on? And maybe that was one of the like reasons, just like the greater level of responsibility. That was one of the reasons why she wasn't as, as happy. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so here's what's interesting. When I was working at StoryBrand, I did all the hiring. I hired every single employee, you know, in my 10 years that I was there. And um, over the last couple of months, I actually actually was, we were looking for somebody who was going to be working uh, as a part of our content team. So looking for somebody who's marketer, copywriter, you know, these kinds of skills. And I get an application in from somebody who's CMO of a company that I was actually familiar with. And I was very intrigued. I'm like, why is a CMO wanting a copywriter content creation role? And so I get on the phone. You know, I, I was like, look, very curious. So I get on the phone. And what I find out is here she was, somebody who loved content creation, copywriting, marketing. But because she was so successful in those roles, she kept getting promoted. And now very little of her day and her work was spent doing the thing that got her into it in the first place. So she was now in this position where she you know, was able to take a job that maybe wasn't paying at the same rate that she used to, but she's redefining success by taking less money to get back into a career that she's more passionate about and more fulfilled by. So... Success isn't about the money, right? Mm -hmm. Success can look like, what if I actually enjoyed my work? And it and it wasn't, and it's not like she's, you know, grinding it. You know, I don't know actually. I feel like she probably was grinding it out. So it's not that she was, you know, a, a victim of any you know horrible thing. She's in a pretty prestigious, luxurious position as a CMO of a company that a, a role that a lot of people would actually probably want to have themselves but she was pretty unhappy. So she starts asking herself some new questions and I really applaud her for you know, having the courage to actually raise her hand and say, I don't know if this is it. You know, Maybe CMO isn't what's gonna make me happy. No, I'm, I'm really glad that we got to this because I think this is uh, super important for people to be aware of as they're navigating through their life, but, but especially their career. I think a lot of people wish they had a position when it's like, you really don't <laughs> like you don't what totally. And one of the things that at least I've heard a lot and I've probably said a lot is who the hell would want to be the president of the United States? Like that would be terrible. <laughs> and so a lot of people, a lot of people put that position on a pedestal and think that is the ultimatum of success when it is, you know, maybe for one and every three million people or, you know, three, one out of every, however many people, but for most people, that's not going to be success. And so I think we often chase down a position at our company or we chase down a raise or we chase down a promotion or whatever it is with 
the lack of awareness that that position is not going to make us happy at all. And so I think that's something to really ask yourself. And so I guess kind of the question is, is how can we gain awareness as to whether the goal that we're chasing down or whether the success that we're chasing down is the appropriate goal or success for us? Yeah. So much of the way that I've learned to define success is by seeing these people in the secret society and just being so inspired by their stories. And, you know, upon yeah. further investigation, researching them, learning more about them, you know, I've started to kind of define what it is that, you know, I found to be my own custom definition of success. So here might be a fun exercise. Okay, so I'm reading this book. Gretchen, Rig uh, Gretchen Rubin has a book called The Happiness Project. And there's this little section that she talks about um, what she calls secrets of adulthood. And it was for her just a fun little list of her writing out like, here's the things that I've learned. So I was inspired reading that. And I'm, you know, at the time I re I'm holding my daughter who is less than a year old, uh, you know, for a nap and I'm on my phone and I just, you know, created a, a note on my phone called Secrets of Adulthood. And I just started writing out these lists. Like, what is it that I've, um, you know, I, what is it that I've learned that maybe I'd want to, you know, teach my kids someday or, you know, whatever. What was amazing is I found this list to be, by the time I was done, I actually counted up and there was a hundred things on this list. Yes. And some of them were fun, but, you know, ultimately it, it ended up being a pretty weighty list of the things that I valued in my life. Or another way to say it is the ways that I define, define success. So I'm looking at this list of 100, and I just started looking for some themes. And I thought it was interesting that in 100 things, I never wrote make a lot of money. Not once. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with people who want to make a lot of money. It's just that was a pretty clear indicator for me. It's like, oh, that's not what motivates me. That's not what's inspiring to me. You know, and so the things, I'll actually read you a couple of these things on the list just to give you an idea of kind of what this thing looks like. So here we go. Um, flip into a page here. Um, here we go. Offer grace over guilt. Do things with excellence and the rest will take care of itself. Gratitude is better than resentment. Be a firefighter. Run toward the problem. Go out of your way to encourage those behind the scenes. If you have a dream, chase it and don't let pessimists derail you. Try to make it to Augusta the first week of April every year for the Masters. <laughs> <laughs> Be where your feet are. You know, so these are the kinds of things that I was writing. And so, so this was really a healthy exercise for me to just start to see what it was that I really did value and the things that I didn't. I value a lot relationships um, that I really strive for excellence and, and love creating things and doing great work. So maybe that's a thing that would be helpful for people if they're trying to figure out how do I define success? Maybe a you know, silly little exercise like the secrets of adulthood might start to point you in the right direction. Yeah, no, I like it. Those are, those are great. Those are great. We'll, we'll see what happens if you can get there, get down there to Augusta here in the uh, first week of April. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I would be very jealous. I, I don't know why I've never been. I, I grew up in Atlanta and I still have never been. And I'm a big golf fan too. You got to uh, get down there. I know. You got to know. We got to figure this out. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I saw as kind of a topping in your book as well is this idea of trying to navigate living in the tension of contentment and striving. And somebody yeah. actually, one of my buddies asked me a question where, having a drink and, and having lunch the other day. And he was asking me what's kind of a similar question or a, sim a similar dichotomy in the sense of what's the balance of gratitude and wanting to become more and wanting to be more. And I feel like that's a pretty s similar dichotomy. So talk a little bit about the balance there and, and living in the tension of contentment and striving. Yeah. I have so many thoughts. I'm like, man, which story do I want to tell? Right. Um, so there's enough books out there that tell you to, you know, shoot for the moon. It's like, and I actually love having big dreams and ambitions. And, you know, 
the people in the secret society, some of these people are the most ambitious people that I know. But I think that there's this message that's like, no matter what, you, no matter where you are, you should always want more. More money, more fame, more attention, more recognition, more people seeing you and the work that you do, a bigger stage, a bigger platform, you know. And the question I think that I have is just, you know, when is enough enough? When is, you know, when, when is enough enough? And uh, I, I'm not a farmer, but I heard something about sheep that I think is pretty interesting and feels pretty relevant to this. So apparently sheep, if left up to themselves, would eat so much that they actually could get sick. And there's something called sheep bloating. So they could just consume so much that they actually could get sick to the point of death. So one of the responsibilities of a shepherd is to not only take them to grazing grounds, but to also make sure that they don't eat too much, right? So um, what they do, and, and here's the thing I think is interesting too, with sheep bloating, you would think that maybe they would be eating some poisonous, some, I don't know, bad grass, if there is bad, whatever, right? But that's not it at all. You're talking about like, sheep in green pastures, healthy things all around them. And I think if you put yourself into that kind of analogy for a second, opportunities are available to us everywhere. And so this message of more, more, more is just so prevalent in our culture that I feel like that is the thing that people are telling us is success. Success is more, right? And what I think is interesting is, you know, there's this verse in Psalms, which is a pretty, you know, popular, well-known verse. It's like, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie in green pastures. And it's like this idea... He. he Oh man, hang on. I'm going to read that one more time because I want to get it right. And I did, hang on one second. It's going to be worth it because I like it. Yeah, that it's point. like, the Lord is my shepherd. It's not, that's not it. Like, that wasn't the exact thing, but it's going to, like, the Lord is my shepherd. Time. I shall not want. He makes me lie he down did. in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That's he restores it. my soul, that thing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes, that's it. Okay, here we go. Th that is, okay. So there's this really well-known verse in Psalms. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So unless you understand sheep bloating, that verse doesn't have the same amount of meaning. Mm. But it's this whole idea of like, will we lie down or will we be forced to lie down? Right, It's like, are we going to wow. have to be pushed down from some kind of tragedy, some kind of failure? Are we going to have to feel bloated from this you know, insatiable desire for more? Or are we able to actually spot this in ourselves and actually allow ourselves to lie down, to maybe not believe that we have to have more, 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 right? And so um, there's, a, there's a time when I really wanted uh, a million dollar house. There's this house down the street. Uh, there's a neighborhood down the street from my house. That's my favorite you know, neighborhood in Nashville. The houses are beautiful. I mean, they're mansions. Each of these houses are, you know, most of them are two and three million dollars. The cheapest house you can buy is a million dollars. So there was a, you know, a couple weeks stretch where I was just, kind of fantasizing about what my life could look like as the owner of one of these houses. And I was telling myself, okay, Tim, this is your 10 year goal, you know? And so I just, I downloaded three different house apps and was just constantly refreshing my search for houses in this neighborhood. And it was interesting how the more often I would be looking for this kind of a house, the more discontent I actually felt with my own life. All of a sudden, my house wasn't nice enough. My car wasn't nice enough. I wasn't making enough money to be able to afford, you know, a house like this. 
So it's just all of these things, this narrative that just started to creep into my mind, like what I had was not enough. And what was really interesting is I kind of was awakened to this realization and I started thinking, okay, I'm, I'm actually pretty unhappy right now, but what is it really about? Why did I really want this house in this neighborhood? And what I realized was I actually just wanted to appear successful to all of my friends because people would see me as the owner of one of those houses and look at me and be like, I don't know what that guy does, but it's something, right? Like he knows what he's doing. I then was looking to be esteemed. I wanted and valued someone else's opinion of me to define the value that I brought, who I was. And, you know, as I, after I learned that, I was like, holy smokes. <laughs> and what's, what's interesting is I live in a great house. There's a little pond out back of my house. And, you know, before we bought it, we like walked up our dr the driveway as we were just, you know, looking at this, you know, house and we saw the water at the edge of the yard and we're like, oh my goodness, like our jaws dropped, me and my wife. I love the house. I love our neighborhood. We take walks in our neighborhood. I mean, it's just everything about it is great. I have everything that I need, but the culture and the environment that we live in just will keep pounding at you. You don't have enough. And and I guess the question to kind of land the plane on this, you know, this, you know, whole idea is do you have enough though? Do you need more to be successful? And also, what is it that really makes you want to have all of these things that you're you know, aspiring for? So I can't tell you what striving is. because there's a, So the problem was not me wanting the million-dollar house. The problem was my intention for wanting the million-dollar house. Yeah, exactly. It was insecurity in disguise. There, there's some people that have a million-dollar house that are actually doing it with the healthiest of you know intentions and you know going about it in a really good way I, that was just not my story so i think for each of us we have to define and we have to actually reflect and and find out okay is this contentment or is this striving right and and we kind of all have to walk that journey on our own yeah i love that and i'm i'm glad that you brought up the psalm and and really hit it home because that was a huge eye opener for me with regards to you know i've heard that psalm over and over again a number of times, but I didn't know what the shepherd loading, shepherd bloating, shepherd loading. Yeah, sheep bloating, sheep bloating. Sheep bloating, sheep bloating. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd never heard that before. And that, like, when you read that, I was like, boom, light bulb moment. That was that was big. And then, like you said, it's about the reason why you do it. One of the things that I talk to people about and one of the things that I like to say is that you don't set a goal based off of what you achieve. You set a goal based off of the person you're going to become in the pursuit of it. And so That's it's cool. like- the striving is not the striving for external things. The striving should be to internally become more and to be internally become an upgraded version of yourself. And I think that's yeah. exactly what you're talking about here. It's like, why do you do it? You want to make sure the why is the why behind your striving is an internal reason rather than a, an external thing that you're trying to gain. Um, but I want to get down here to uh, the last question. Before I ask the last question, I just want to acknowledge you, Tim. I know that it was a, it's been a big leap of faith here to make the jump to kind of you know go into the spotlight, if you will, just to uh, use that terminology. And I know you've crushed your career over the last 10, 15 years, and to to make this jump is a like like you said in your post one time is a leap of faith. But I know that you're doing it for the right reasons, and and because you're doing it for the right reasons, it's going to allow you to gain the success that you want to gain out of it. I truly believe that if you do that for the right reasons, you're going to get the success out of it that you that you want to get. So I just want to acknowledge you for making that leap of faith and, and spreading this message. You. It's so important. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I feel really grateful for the opportunity. And, you know, I think I would have kicked myself if I didn't give it a shot. And I think for me, I just really wanted to see it through and just see just in the people that I've been talking to over the last five years as I've been working on this book, these themes and these, you know, messages just kind of were everywhere. And the more I talked about, it, 
with people, the more I realized, wow, this is a huge problem. And something as simple as defining success could be the catalyst to somebody having a, a meaningful life and, and, and career or not. Because I, we haven't figured out how we define success, it just I seems think like it, such an easy thing. I think I think it is I think it is the thing that will determine whether or not you have a fulfilling life and career. Because I think, like you said, people need to ask themselves, "Am I unhappy right now?" And I literally think that, and you use the word too. I really think that unhappiness is a signal to you that there's a there's a misalignment between yes. between who what your definition of success actually is and what you're currently chasing down. Right. And I think, yeah, I've, I truly believe if you, if you're watching on video, it's like this, if this is what your success actually is, but you, you don't have the awareness to realize that then the further away, the definition of success is that you're actually chasing the more unhappy, the more unfulfilled, the more lack of meaning that you actually have in your life. And so it's really important to gain awareness around your own definition of success. And that's why I feel like this message is the thing that everybody needs to start with, with regards to having a purposeful and a meaningful career and life. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yeah, obviously, you do. obviously you do. Uh, well, that's why I'm going to be such a proponent. You guys need to go get this book again, The Secret Society of Success, Stop Chasing the Spotlight and Learn to Enjoy Your Work and Life. Uh, make sure you guys go follow Tim on Instagram at Tim Schur, which is T I M. S C H U R R E R. You can also find him on LinkedIn. And like you said, he's got his own podcast, Building a Winning Team podcast. Uh, is there any other play? And his book is out for pre order right now. It, well, it'll be probably released by the time this podcast is out. But May 17th uh, is when the, the book is released. So make sure you guys go grab it on Amazon. And when you get it and you start reading it, make sure you leave it a rating and review to help. Tim out and get that book up there in the ranks. And other than that, is there other play, good place that people should go learn more about you and everything like that? That's it, man. That and 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 I I just kind of want to I love this thought. So I would love to just share it before we go. There's this yeah. beautiful quote that I think really framed up so much of this for me and really was a North Star when it came to, you know, wanting to communicate some type of message around redefining success. Albert Schweitzer said, I don't know what your destiny will be. Some of you will perhaps occupy remarkable positions. Perhaps some of you will become famous by your pens or as artists. But I know one thing, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. And that to me is just such an inspiration. If we actually live our lives through the, how can I serve? Who am I here for? How can I find success that's maybe different from this cultural message that just won't seem to let up? I just feel like this is the path to, you know, finding that meaning and that fulfillment and the enjoyment. Like, let's actually go out there and have some fun. Enjoy this life. And I think that this can make all the difference. Our mindset, the way that we think about these things changes everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No doubt. I appreciate you sharing that quote. Well, last question here, Tim, is I think that getting closer to the best version of yourself is both a constant journey. I don't think we're ever at the best version of ourselves, And I also believe, as we've kind of talked about all podcasts, that it's a very unique journey. The way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So the last question is for you personally. If there are three things that you could currently do or three things that you could currently work on to get closer to the best version of Tim Sure that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Man, here's the three things really that, that are top of mind for me. Redefining success is, you know, even as you think about, okay, me transitioning into this career, me launching this book, I too have to ask myself, I'm in that season where I say, what is success? What does this look like? So to me, it's just constantly asking yourself that question and checking your intentions anytime mm. you want to you know, go and do something. So I would say redefining success is, is one thing. The second thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about is help others win. 
So am I only doing things that serve me or am I willing to actually invest in things that can help someone else? And if I am living in the way that is kind of being all about the assist, helping others win, I think I'm living, you know, the best me. Um, and then another that I think is, is really great is kind of this idea of, you know, one life at a time. So I think there's a lot of people that really want to make an impact in their life and their career. And I think that's fantastic. But what I've found is there's a lot of these people who have achieved a, a massive amount of success and have actually inspired a lot of people. I think about Blake Mykoski, who started Tom Shoes. His company sold 95 million pairs of shoes, but he didn't get there by trying to you know, disrupt a you know, shoe industry by creating this one-for-one -one business model. That, that's not it at all. He actually was trying to just get shoes for a village. 250 pairs of shoes, that was his goal. So you know, as I think about how I want to impact the people around me, I actually just want to be more interested in the one life that I'm impacting and not being so worried about how that could accumulate over time. So for a lot of people, you know, you think about who am I here for, that might look like you serving your family. You know, in that same keynote that I told you from Anna Stanley, he's like saying, hey, parents, you know, your greatest achievement may not be something you do, but in someone you raise. Yeah. You just think about the impact that so many of us have. You know, if you do have kids, like that is a life that you get to impact and shape. And so, but even if it's for a business, yeah, you might be, you know, you might not have millions of followers online and, you know, be blasting out messages to, you know, tons of people. But I think about the person, you know, that's, a nurse helping that one patient, you know, whatever. So all that to say, redefining success, helping others win, just really focusing on impacting one life at a time. I just think if I'm doing those three things, I'm, I'm in a pretty good spot. Yeah, no, those are three great things. I, I think you really hit the point home and I think those were awesome, man. So everybody make sure you guys go grab a copy of the book, The Secret Society of Success by Tim Schur. Make sure you follow him on Instagram once you order it rate and review the book on Amazon and share it with a friend or family member and share this episode with a friend or family member as well. But Tim, that's all we got today, man. Really appreciate you hopping on. I had so much fun. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate you having me.